Okay, we're talking about heart physiology, and one of the things that uh, we should be aware of is that the heart has a variable um, stroke volume and rate, and those two things combined equal the cardiac output, how much the heart is able to pump. And the cardiac output obviously varies according to how much need there is for the heart to pump blood. So the heart is a very efficient pump, and its cardiac output is a measure of how much the heart can pump. There are two, for, uh, two terms we need to be familiar with. One is the stroke volume, and it's a measure of how much the heart ejects each time it contracts. Heart rate, which is a measure of how many times the heart beats in a minute. When you multiply these two quantities, you get what's called the cardiac output. So for example, if a heart has a stroke volume of 50 mLs, meaning that every time the muscle contracts, it squirts out 50 milliliters of blood, and then if the heart is contracting 100 times a minute, what is the cardiac output? Stroke volume times heart rate will give you the cardiac output. So 50 mLs per beat times 100 beats per minute, beats cancel, and you get 5,000 milliliters per minute, or that would be 5 liters per minute. In fact, a normal heart pumps about 300 liters an hour, but is capable of pumping up to five times as much, depending also on how, um, how fit a person is. Somebody who's more fit will have a higher cardiac output than somebody who is not. And, and if that cardiac output falls below a certain amount, then we start seeing uh, the effects of uh, heart failure, which can show, begin to show up as uh, people being out of breath when they do mild exertions, or uh, they start swelling in various parts of their body, they get something called dropsy, which is where, the, the, because the heart's not pumping properly, fluid starts to collect in the lower areas of their body. Uh, one of the peculiar things about the cells in the heart is that they have an internal rhythmicity. If you take a single cell by itself from the heart, the, the cell will contract all by itself. It'll, it'll have a rhythmic pulsation. One of the other things that you'll notice is if you take two heart cells, they'll be beating at different rates, and uh, the result is that um, if you were to put them, touch them together, they would start beating at the same rate. So there's something about when the cells touch that causes them to coordinate their pumping movements. Another one of the interesting observations about the heart is when you breathe in, it speeds up. And when you breathe out, the heart tends to slow down. So that makes sense because when you breathe in, you're oxygenating the, um, the blood, and then the heart has to pump that newly oxygenated blood throughout the body. Also, we notice that the left side of the heart is thicker. As the muscles are thicker because that's the side that does most of the work. All the, the, when the left side contracts, the blood from the left ventricle gets injected into the aorta, which spreads blood out throughout the whole body. The right side of the heart, heart on the other hand, pumps the blood to the lungs. So it's not as thick as the left side but it also does a very important job of, of bringing the blood to the lungs and then bringing it back to the heart to be pumped over the, um, over the whole body. Now, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong when the heart is forming. And uh, there are birth defects, for example, where the chambers are joined where they shouldn't be, or the, sometimes you can even have the artery and the vein reversed. So people, children who are born with these defects have to have uh, emergency surgery to fix themselves. The fastest your heart can beat is about 220 minus your age. So if you're 15 years old, your maximum heart rate is roughly 205 beats per minute. And that capacity tends to diminish as you get older, and this is why older people have to work more carefully around their target heart rate so that they don't over, uh, overtax themselves. The lungs also work with the heart to form the respiratory system. The lungs oxygenate air and dispose of carbon dioxide along with other substances that are found, such as water vapor and other things that are dissolved in the blood, which are volatile. Uh, the lungs are flexible sacs. They're sort of like balloons that can inflate. Mind you, they're not, they don't have the texture of balloons. They have a, a kind of a, um, a, a textured surface with, with, uh, with the ability to inflate and they follow the rib cage. So when the rib cage expands, if you can think of the ribs as sort of hoops that tilt upwards, and when they tilt upwards, it increases the volume of the rib cage. The lungs follow the vacuum that is created when the rib cage expands. The other way is with the diaphragm. The diaphragm is sort of a uh, um, concave muscle, and when it contracts, it straightens out, flattens out, and it creates a void behind it, and the lungs will follow that void to inflate. 
So uh, breathing in is a combination of the ribcage expanding and the diaphragm contracting. The, vol the lungs follow the vacuum created by the movement of the ribcage and they inflate. That's how we breathe in. Now if a hole is poked into the sac surrounding the lungs, say if somebody gets a stick poking through their ribs and it causes air to enter into that area under the ribcage but above the lungs, then you get what's called a collapsed lung because the air enters in and there's no longer the vacuum that helps the lungs to inflate. And that's what you call a collapsed lung. It's a potentially life-threatening condition. Uh, the medical name for it is pneumothorax. So what they would do in that situation is they would have to fix the hole and then drain out the air and the fluid that was in between the lungs and the ribcage to allow the person to breathe again. Although it does happen, I don't know if it's still done, that uh, somebody will have a lung operation, they'll actually cut out a piece of the lung for whatever reason, cancer or, or an incurable infection, and then maybe sometimes they allow the lung not to move uh, so that it can heal. I don't know if that's still done. I may be reading very old medical information, but at any, at any rate, uh, the idea of a pneumothorax is that there's air in between the rib cage and the lung that doesn't allow the lung to inflate. It can also be fluid, not just air.